Um, we are uh, carrying out a research program in Amsterdam and our university that is focused on uh, government to uh, business contracts with the researchers from with both a public uh, law background and a, uh, a private law background. And uh, one of the research themes, among other themes in that research program, is this interaction between European public procurement law and uh, national contract law. Um, um, as we uh, all know, that is that um, whenever a contract is being concluded, whether by business to consumer or business to business, or as is the case here between a government and the business, uh, that legal relationship is being uh, uh, dealt with uh, by rules of contract law. And uh, what we also know is that um, the formation process, the formation of such a contract in a regulated context is being dealt with by rules of public procurement law. And um, the research project is about the interaction between these two uh, bodies of law. Um, I wrote a paper together with my team uh, on this issue, which is a bit of a starting paper to problematize this interaction. We wrote that for the uh, International Public Procurement Conference that was held in Seattle in, in August. And uh, this presentation is based on that uh, publication. And uh, I will show you the hyperlink at the end of the presentation where you can download uh, the paper. Um, these are my team members. These are all PhD researchers uh, who are all writing their own PhD on one particular topic within the broader theme of, uh, theme of interaction between uh, public procurement law and uh, uh, contract law. Um, what is the, the context of this interaction? The, the context is twofold. Uh, one part of the context we already heard uh, this morning, it's the, um, the, the context of reform of public procurement law. We heard about the new uh, directive proposals, we saw what the objectives of the proposal are, and we saw that one of the objectives is to facilitate the uh, cross-border participation of uh, particularly uh, small and medium enterprises in the government-to-business market and the objective is being achieved, or trying to, to be achieved in a manner that was, uh, was uh, presented earlier on. That's one part of uh, the context. Um, the second part of the context, and maybe not every one of you is aware of this, is that um, the uh, EU is also working very hard for many decades now to harmonize European contract law, and in fact, this process was once started in 1989 by a resolution of the European Parliament. And uh, we, here too we see that the objective of that harmonization process is again the removal of trade barriers, but now trade barriers that are being caused by differences between national legal systems. And um, many has been achieved already in this area as regards binding regulation, we have to think of all kinds of directives in specific domains of contract law, dealing with specific types of contracts. And the more overall approach has been carried out in the last uh, 15 years, uh, and um, in particularly in the domain of the drafting of a so-called common frame of reference. Um, as we speak, there is a uh, a so-called draft common frame of reference in the drawer of the uh, European Commission and um, it has been, the, uh, academics have worked on that draft common frame of reference for many, many years. I was involved in that process as well and if you <coughs> open it and you read it, it looks like a European civil code. It, don't be afraid, it's not binding regulation and, and it's going to be a long time before we will see it to be binding regulation. But it is one of the major steps being taken by the European Commission in order to harmonize contract law. And another more recent uh, step in that process is the proposal for regulation on a common European sales law. So these are the two contexts um, that are relevant in the debate on interaction between contract law 
and public procurement law. Now, if we look at these, uh, the second context, we see that it is particularly focused on contracts between business to consumers and business to businesses. It's not, being fo it's not at focusing at all at the contracts we are talking about today, uh, government and uh, business contracts. Now, that being the case, we came up with a research uh, question. So the proposition is that all these harmonization efforts in the area of contract law, they do not involve government to business contracts. And then our question is, can we problematize that from uh, given that the uh, EU, uh, European Commission, has the objective to, to reform public procurement law with a specific aim to establish an internal market for government to uh, business uh, uh, contracts, particularly in the domain of small and medium uh, enterprises. Um, in order to answer that research question, we first have to learn a bit more about um, what are typical conflict issues that can arise in a contract between the government and the business. So if we focus on that, we can see many uh, examples of conflict issues and most of them you will probably know from your own uh, practice. Uh, there can be a problem about inaccuracy in communication, uh, interpretation problems, gaps in the contract, unfair contracts, uh, change of circumstances problems or variation orders from the client. This is what people fight about in the uh, performance of a government to business contract, not only in my country, but in many contract, uh, countries. Um, and it is contract law that needs to solve these uh, issues. Um, what is the, uh, usually the cause of uh, these conflict uh, issues? You can't read it on, the, on something as a change on the top of the slide, but it says the cause is pre-contractual communication. Many problems that occur in the contract stage are in fact rooted in bad communication in the pre-contractual stage. So what contract law does, it provides remedies, and many of these remedies are in fact based on uh, pre-contractual duties to inform. So it is said, this is the problem, we're going to give you that remedy because the other party didn't communicate properly with you in the pre-contractual stage. <coughs> An example, for instance, is where parties have a conflict on the interpretation of the contract. So we have ambiguous contract documents where there is a clause or a provision in the documents that can be read in different uh, ways. It can have different meanings. There's a conflict. And then contract law helps us to solve that conflict issue by uh, applying a criterion uh, in order to, to, to decide what does the contract actually say. And um, the rule that is being used to solve that particular problem uh, in the draft common frame of reference, remember this European Civil Code, is this particular rule. We have to look at what was the common intention of the parties if we look at the circumstances in which this contract was concluded, how did they negotiate, how did they behave themselves in the pre-contractual stage, and that information will help us to decide this has to be the interpretation of the contract. Now back to the research question. Um, what we said is uh, the uh, EU is not involved right now in harmonizing public contract law and is that a problem perhaps in the public procurement law context? So let's put back the public procurement uh, context. Um, we could ask whether public procurement law itself provides for pre-contractual duties to communicate aimed at preventing all these problems in the contract stage. Because if that is the case, then it's not such a big problem that we have no harmonization efforts right now in the domain of public contract law. So what we did is we analyzed public procurement law. Are there any pre-contractual duties to communicate to be found in public procurement law? And we all know, yes, there are information duties to be found in public procurement law, but they have a very specific goal. The goal of the pre-contractual duties to communicate in public procurement law are to assure that no procedural risks will occur, that 
principle of transparency and principle of equal treatment are being observed. All these pre-contractual duties to inform in public procurement law have no meaning whatsoever for the prevention of these contracting conflict issues in the contract stage. So our preliminary conclusion was and is public procurement law does not deal with conflict issues that can occur in the contract stage. And that means that whenever such an issue arises, it has to be solved by the national courts of the member states who have to apply national contract law. Now then the question is, what does that mean for the objective of the internal market? Is that objective perhaps under threat? Um, we see two problems. Um, one problem is a general problem that has been recognized for 25 years now by the European Commission, differing systems of contract law can hinder cross-border trade. It has also been said by the European Commission in the proposal for a new regulation on sales law, um, for traders these differences generate complexity and costs, notably when they want to export their product and service to other EU member states. And this proposition is being backed by surveys carried out on behalf of the European Commission in the area of business to consumer and business to business contracts. Um, we see no reason why this problem would be different in the market of government to business contracts. Uh, perhaps even the problem is more severe. It's not only differing systems of contract law that hinder cross broader trade, there's also the problem in this particular domain of unclear systems of contract law. And that brings me to the second problem. The second problem is that, um, and I'm now speaking about my own country, and I'm very interested in how this works in other countries. In my country, judges have great difficulties in applying national contract law on contract issues that arise in a contract that has been concluded after a regulated tendering procedure. Because we have to ask the question, and this is difficult for our judges to answer, um, what does it mean for the application of national contract law that this particular contract was concluded following a regulated tendering procedure? A procedure regulated by EU public procurement law. The fact that third parties' uh, interests might be affected by the fact that you apply national contract law in the ordinary way. So courts have difficulties in answering these questions and that increases the uncertainty about what is actually the law, not only in the national level but also in the cross-border context of course. So our proposition is that first the general problem, differences um, are capable, differences between legal systems uh, are capable of causing legal uncertainty um, and that might hinder cross-border trade. That is already the, the, the general uh, problem that is being observed by the European Commission. That is on, at the basis of all these harmonization efforts. But uh, an additional problem is that in the particular context of government to business contracts concluded after a regulated tendering procedure, this legal uncertainty will even increase. Um, what we then did is that we carried out a, an analysis of several case studies, case studies that are all uh, uh, focused on these conflict issues that you saw on the slide earlier on, and we analyzed how are these conflict issues, how can they be solved if we apply national contract law. What we did not do is that we applied all the laws of the 28 member states, but we apply these general rules that you can find in this European Civil Code thing that is in the drawer right now. And that's what we did. So these are the uh, issues and um, we applied DCFR to that. And what we found was that many of the solutions to these conflict issues in the contract stage uh, are in many cases uh, controversial in the sense that they do not always reflect what is the common core of European contract law right now. There are still many differences not to be solved by this DCFR. And secondly, and this is more important I think, is that many solutions we found in this draft common frame of reference, they all assume these legal solutions, 
uh, that the parties to the contract, the government and the business, are allowed to exchange information prior to the conclusion of the contract whenever they want, that they can negotiate uh, the rules, they assume that courts can give remedies changing the rights and duties under the contract and that third party interests are not involved whatsoever. That's what we found if you apply uh, contract law to these um, uh, uh, conflict issues. For example, the uh, conflict issue of mistake, the government and the business enter into a contract, one of the parties argues I concluded the contract under influence of mistake, you didn't tell me something which I should have known in advance or you told me something that was not right, um, I want to avoid uh, the contract. Yes indeed, the national contract law has rules to solve this conflict issue, but the rules in the legal systems are very different. Uh, particularly as regards what duties does a party have prior to the conclusion of the contract as regards giving information to the other party. There is a big gap between common law and civil law. I probably won't have to tell you about that. Um, that's one problem, which uh, one, one phenomenon that um, confirms the general problem. But secondly, um, the uh, concept of mistake and similar concepts in other member states are all based on the perception that there are duties to inform to a certain extent, um, bilateral duties to inform between, in this case, the government and the business, but um, these uh, rules do not take into account that such information exchange, bilateral information exchange, is a problem in a regulated context. Public procurement law does not allow in many cases, the bilateral exchange of information prior to the conclusion of the contract. That's a problem. Second example is the interpretation of the contract. Again, the government and the business have a conflict issue. They have differing views on what the contract says. There is a clause in the contract, but you can, you can interpret it in, in, in many ways. So we have rules that help the parties uh, by means of a judge, a judge who then has to apply a criterion to, uh, to solve uh, the conflict uh, issue. That uh, criterion is usually based on uh, what is the common intention of the parties, what is the subjective objective, su but mainly subjective intention of, the, of these uh, parties. Again, that can be made of a problem in an EU regulated context in the sense that what the subjective intention of these two parties is will not have to be the same as what is in fact the objective meaning of the clause in the contract uh, that is, uh, uh, and the objective criterion is a far more differing uh, criterion than the criterion that is now being applied under the rules of contract law. If I'm speaking about the objective criterion, I'm talking about the criterion which you can all find in, we all find that in the famous case of Suki di Fruta, the, the famous public procurement case. It's a totally different uh, um, uh, interpretation uh, criterion. Uh, and a second example, a third example, and that's my last example, is the problem of the gap in the contract. Something is not being dealt with in the contract and the parties have to go to the courts and ask, please uh, fill in the gap. Um, and in that case, uh, what happens is that um, courts need to imply terms in the contract which could mean that the, the, the contract um, imposes uh, differing duties on the parties than the parties perceived prior to the conclusion of the contract. Um, you could problematize this from the perspective of the, 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 the topic of modification of contracts. Uh, what is now being dealt with in the uh, new, regu new uh, pr uh, proposal on the directive is modification of contracts by the parties. But what we have to be aware of is that the national contract law systems in many countries give a lot of power to the judges to actually modify the contract. And I'm not talking about modification of the scope of the contract, that too indeed, but also modification of we take away this risk from you or we're putting back a risk in the contracts uh, of which you perceive that it was not, uh, not on, your, uh, on your side. So, um, 
The question then is, should the European Commission consider action in this domain? Um, uh, a, an argument pro would be that the legal uncertainty argument is not only present in business-to-consumer and business-to-business -business, uh, contracts, it is also present in government-to-business contracts. Legal uncertainty argument that can be related to the transaction cost argument, which is the big argument for the European Commission right now to undertake action in business-to-business -business and business-to-consumer area. Um, a counter-argument could be that we say, well, these national courts, they should just interpret the national contract law in light of the wording and the purpose of public procurement law. That is true, but then the question is, how should the national courts do that? It's, I'm, not telling, I'm not saying that I'm living in a country where the, the, we have the best judges in the world, not at all, but they have big difficulty in actually applying national contract law in this regulated context. Um, and what we, the, the future would then be a case-by-case -case approach of the national courts, eventually guided by uh, case law decisions of the European Court of Justice, but that will take a very long time, and I'm not sure whether that will result in a clear, consistent and comprehensive system of government to business contract law. And a positive <laughs> approach would be um, if we would um, put this government to business contract thing also in the ambit of these harmonization efforts of the European Commission, um, that might perhaps uh, contribute to further opening up the uh, internal market for government to business contracts. It's a more positive approach than the negative approach. We have to regulate these markets in order to prevent bi-national practices. Uh, the positive approach would then be in order to uh, make more similar the contract law, uh, the, the government to business contract law in, in, in Europe, um, this could be a, a, a positive uh, step towards uh, further opening up that, uh, that market. So the recommendation of my team is, and, and please read this carefully, we're not saying there should be immediately action. What we, th what we th say is, we think, we think there is a problem here. And we think the European Commission should be aware of this problem and should at least broaden its focus and problematize the government to business contracts uh, domain in, in the broader area of its actions aimed at the harmonization of European contract law. This is what our paper is about. You can find it on uh, this hyperlink, which will be probably be put on the website. And uh, if you have any other questions after the conference, feel free to contact me. Thank you for your attention.